Our next um, session uh, was going to be moderated by Emma Sapala, who actually is uh, our new uh, associate director at Seacare. Um, Unfortunately, uh, she became quite ill right before leaving for the conference, and although she actually really wanted to come, I actually wouldn't let her come uh, because I was very concerned about her. So she uh, is not here. So I uh, am going to moderate the next panel, which is called uh, Compassion, Compassion Building Interventions. Um, we're going to start with uh, Leah Weiss as our first speaker today. Leah actually uh, uh, recently received her PhD, but she has a long history in education and compassion training. And she's our director of education and has been uh, uh, intimately involved with the uh, <clears throat> CCARE, what we call CCT program, working closely with Tupton Jinpa and uh, with uh, uh, the several psychologists who have participate in, in the design of that secularized program. So uh, <clears throat> without further ado, uh, here's Leah, if you'll welcome her. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm so enjoying these presentations and conversations that we're having. So as Dr. Dodi said, my, um, my day job is education director at CARE. And um, one of um, my great privileges is to work on compassion cultivation training, or CCT as we call it. And, um, <clears throat> and what we've learned in a short two years about the training's power and potential to alleviate suffering. At CCARE, we conduct research and provide trainings that will get us closer to a compassion-driven world by drawing on the disciplines of neuroscience, psychology, economics, and contemplative traditions. And one project we're very excited about that's showing great promise is the Compassion Cultivation Training, which is developed by Tupton Jimpa in conversation with a really incredible interdisciplinary team of researchers. These are some of Tupton Jimpa's words about CCT and its primary aims. What CCT aims to do is to, pay, is to make people become more aware and more connected with their compassionate nature so that their instinctive response to a given situation will come from that compassionate understanding standpoint rather than negative excessive judgment. So to be more aware and connected to our compassionate nature and avoid negative responses. So you see in this, in this um, statement, we acknowledge the innate nature of compassion, but also the lived experience we have as individuals and collectives that we're not always coming from a place of compassion, even despite our best intentions. So I won't get too much into the question of what is compassion other than to provide a, a working definition for my presentation. We'll be having throughout the weekend a lot of discourse around what compassion is and how it can be measured. But for this purpose, recognizing suffering, feeling concern and connection, a desire to relieve suffering, and a willingness to act. So CCT is intended to help people engage with suffering and increase their capacity to draw on compassion rather than diverge off into other potential responses, such as apathy, emotional overwhelm, judgment, to name a few of the other options that we have when we encounter suffering. So CCT is organized into an eight-week training. Um, Two-hour sessions once a week is the general program. We start with mindfulness and settling the mind, and then move on to compassion for a loved one, someone that it's easy to feel a sense of connection to. And then we turn that inward. We turn that towards ourself. And self-compassion, loving kindness for self, is really the crux of... Um, the matter, this relationship between self-compassion and extending compassion is something we spend a lot of time exploring. Then we move on to focusing on shared common humanity, this principle that can maybe best be summarized as just like me, engaging with other people from that perspective. And then we move on to focusing 
our compassion in widening circles. So compassion for people who are close to us, strangers, and then more difficult, challenging people. From there, we move on to actively taking on suffering, so engaging with suffering, right, part of compassion, and transforming it and sending out relief from suffering. And it culminates in an integrated compassion um, practice. So one thing to say, um, sometimes I think when we talk about CCT, um, because meditation is a core element of it, it might eclipse the fact that there's other aspects of the training. Psychoeducation, a lot of dyad work, so I was very interested this morning to hear about some of the implications um, of, of dyad um, exchanges in, in engaging um, with evoking compassion, a lot of uh, group discussion. Um, so trying to engage the whole person in this process of cultivating compassion. So I want to briefly touch on um, two areas where we've um, been measuring and working with CCT. The first is a randomized control trial that was run out of Stanford. And the second is, um, is to give a little bit of a framework around two training cycles we've done with veterans at the residential PTSD unit at the Palo Alto VA system. We've also taught CCT at Sharp Healthcare, Cancer Support Networks, public classes at Stanford and Berkeley to Stanford undergraduates, CEU workshops and healthcare settings, and soon with teachers of K-12. But to focus back in on the research now, so in the initial trial, 100 adults were recruited from local communities. 60 were assigned to the training, compassion training, and 40 were assigned to a control group on a wait list. The average age of the participants was the, in mid-40s. The majority of the participants were Caucasian, and the majority were also women of those who participated in CCT. In terms of results, um, we used measures, these are two of the measures that were used, and there's, there's a lot of other um, stuff to speak about, but fear of compassion scale, and uh, Dr. Neff, who's here with us this weekend, um, her self-compassion scale were two of the measures that we used. And what was found is that CCT significantly increased compassion for others, receiving compa capacity to receive compassion from others, and also self-compassion. So all three of these aspects of of compassion were, um, were influenced by the training. And this is just a chart to demonstrate the compassion for oneself, for others, and from others were all increased. So the results indicate to us that individuals can, in fact, become trained to become more aware of and connected to their compassionate nature and to have the capacity to demonstrate that in a measurable way over a period of, of eight weeks. So now I'd like to turn our attention to the VA trainings. Uh, we are seeing encouraging results in the trainings we have conducted with groups of military veterans at the PTSD residential unit in Menlo Park, part of the Palo Alto VA system. Now this residential unit brings people from um, a variety of geographical locations. It's a magnet. People get sent to this residential treatment program, which does influence the nature of the population. Um, more could be said about that, and perhaps best by a, um, one of our participants, the, the director of, the, of that unit is here, so maybe, I'll, maybe she'll come into the conversation later. Um, we adapted the trainings in this context from their eight-week, once-a-week format to be compressed into twice a week to um, overlap with the men's length of stay, because the eight weeks long duration wouldn't have worked. And so there was some accompanying adaptations that we did in this setting. Um, the men had the option to do group meditation practice in the morning, whereas people taking the public class go home and use guided meditation CDs. Um, and the whole course was more compressed. Um, there's a lot to be said about the kind of adaptations that were made in this population um, to make meditation accessible um, and maybe um, some of the, the considerations we had were, how do you engage with a group who's experiencing hypervigilance, um, emotional numbing, or anger, and have a group comprised of people who are experiencing both of those issues, trying to talk about compassion. So these were some of the challenges we were thinking about going into this, um, this pilot. 
So here's a few of the men who've gone through the training. And in the far back, you can see Dr. Jim Hollenbeck, who's a, a co-teacher with me. And he's um, been a physician in the VA for about as long as I've been alive. He's also on the School of Medicine staff at Stanford. Um, so I just want to interject uh, before I get on to more about what we found, that from my perspective, working with these men has been one of the most humbling experiences of my life. Um, seeing the challenges that they face in their day-to-day -day experience was just incredible when coupled with the courage it took for them to engage with confronting their fears in this immediate of a way, sitting in, with their own mind, engaging with meditation, engaging with challenging propositions like self-compassion, you know, given their history. So it was, it was quite an incredible experience from our perspective as teachers. Um, now what I want to turn to is after we completed the first two rounds of trainings, we did in-depth interviews, one-hour interviews with the participants, with nine of the participants and two of the clinicians who had sat in on all of the trainings and participated in this, um, in this unfolding. So I want to share some of their observations with you now. First, a little bit about the demographics of the men. Three of them were in their 60s, so Vietnam era vets, four in their 50s, one in their 40s, and one in their 30s. And this is the group that we interviewed now. There, there, were, some, there were other people who took the course. We interviewed three Latino men and, one, and six white men. So as I mentioned, when these men volunteered for the compassion training group, they'd been struggling with enormous emotional and psychological challenges, including self-hatred, self-blame, uh, which are clustered under moral injury um, in, in terms of the mental health rhetoric, um, undeservingness of, of happiness, um, just head noise, a lot of chaos in their head, reliving experiences, a lot of them have constant ringing in their ears, numbing, isolation, hypervigilance, um, this kind of thing was, was what was in the room. Here are a couple of quotes from the men themselves about their stressors. I have no self-worth and a lot of hatred for myself for what I've done in the military, taking lives and causing loss of lives. In another, I just don't have compassion for anyone. I mean, even when my wife had cancer, I was just numb to it. Like I had no empathy even to that. The vets definitely had some early skepticism about the training and the whole idea of CCT as a tool that could help them. Their, their skepticism fell into a few buckets, such as, this is a little odd, this isn't how a military man acts, and compassion's just not part of who I am, it's not in me. Um, and here's two quotes to illustrate this. It's unmanly for us to show feelings and to show compassion to others. You're not supposed to care about others. For me, I had to be hard and I had to be tough. And another said, I had these walls up. If I show compassion for somebody, then somehow I'm going to be vulnerable. I did not want to do that initially. So after the training, the men reported a greater sense of hope in their lives and in the future, and it expressed more clearly desires to have healthy connections and relationships with family, spouses, and children. One of the particularly striking elements in this course was how visualization was such a tremendous resource for the participants. We were quite surprised, actually. Visualization is a part of, of the way that we do our compassion training. Um, and here's a, a quote from one of the participants. When I was in the service, I was stationed in Alaska. And you know, I'm not particularly well-traveled, but I've never seen a more beautiful place than some of the places I've seen in Alaska. They're just amazing. So I kind of go back there when I'm meditating. It kind of brings me back to that, a place where, again, I felt confident, where I felt, you know, like I could conquer the world and connected. And it was really quite incredible to see how the men, when they described their visualization of these places, they didn't just talk about sights, they talked about sounds, tactile sensations, wind. It was really a multi-sensory experience. And we're very interested to research why this might be the case and how we can um, we can improve the course and, and treatment to target this capacity that they so clearly seem to have. Um, another 
important part of the course that the men spoke about was the use of prompts. Um, so prompts is what we meant by um, between um, sessions, people would have homework. They'd have to do their meditation, and then they would have an informal homework assignment. And prompts became really the focus here. So picking something like when your cell phone rings, to be your reminder to take some breaths or to recall your intention to relate to the person with you from a perspective of just like me. So here's a, a quote um, from one of the men about his application of these prompts. One of the things that I struggle with, being out in the public and being out in crowds, those prompts and the meditation would help me lower my anxiety. We went to a ball game a couple of weeks ago at AT&T Park. For me, that was really stressful. It was scary and stressful. When I used the prompts and the meditation, I was able to get rid of some of that anxiety. I was able to enjoy the ball game. We were interested in how CCT would interface with the men's capacity for compassion for themselves and for others. And I can say unequivocally that self-compassion was the most challenging aspect of the course, um, the one that met the most strong resistance, and probably um, you know, the pivot point for their experience, um, coupled with the common humanity, just like me, kind of approach. So here's one man's statement. I was able to turn loose a lot of my hatred I have for a gentleman that I am a neighbor to. I found myself contemplating ways of killing him, which is what led him into residential treatment, actually expressing homicidal ideation. I have now lost all of that hatred. I have learned through the tapes and having compassion for myself and having compassion for others and releasing some of that anger and hatred and hate that's only hurting me, not him. And it, it was an exceptional story to hear from, from this man how the meditation transformed his uh, experience. Signs of self-forgiveness. I realize it's time to let some of that hatred go for myself. I never would have been there at war on my own, but I got put there and I did what I was told to do. I just realized, you know, it's not all my fault. So in the interviews, men also expressed inspiring confidence and excitement about getting on with their lives and not falling back into their darkness expressed a confidence about carrying this forward, but also a, a fear of losing, dropping tools and returning back into the mental states they had come out of. And I'll move towards conclusion by presenting clinicians' um, views. So the experiences that the men described to us in their progress was also reflected in, in the clinician's perspective on, on the groups. To these guys and to us, those are huge shifts, and I think those kinds of shifts were evident in the group. People having the desire to reconnect with loved ones in a different way, having a desire to not fly off the handle at the annoying person in the grocery store in front of them in line. I mean, using those people as prompts, which was what was talked about in the group, I think was really incredible. And it seemed that through this training that the men actually became leaders in their, in their community. And here's a quote expressing that. In heated kinds of community exchanges sometimes, it seemed like the guys who'd been in sea care were the voice of reason, able to be much more collected and reflective on the process. That's huge and will have huge implications for their marriages, for their relationships at work, and with family and friends. I want to close with an image. This is the garden that the men planted and care for outside the building where they stay and where we met. Beautiful, right? At this point in our work, we're very encouraged by CCT and the early impact it's having on participants. We believe that this training can be applied to and have impact on trauma and suffering in a wide range of areas, healthcare and education, in the work environment, in family systems, and more. As I said in the opening, we fundamentally believe that CCT can be a powerful source for creating a happier and more joyful world for everyone. Much gratitude to Dr. Doty, Tupton Jimpa, and the PTSD unit, the VA, for working with us. Thanks so much. <laughs>